You know, in 2010, Wendy, is it Ruderman? Uh, Ruderman. Ruderman. Wendy Ruderman and Barbara Laker won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting for their series uh, in the Philadelphia Daily News that exposed a rogue police narcotics squad. The series, which was titled Tainted Justice, led to an FBI probe in the review of hundreds of criminal cases tainted by the scandal. Both Barbara and Wendy have some of the classic characteristics of successful investigative reporters. They're workaholics, they're tenacious, and they have journalism in their blood, knowing that they've wanted to report since their school days. Barbara studied journalism at the University of Missouri and Wendy at Columbia. And both had worked at other news organizations before landing at the Daily News, Barbara in 1993 and Wendy uh, 14 years later. Their new book, Busted, chronicles their journalistic investigation. It's a reminder of the critical watchdog role that daily print newspapers can still play in this country. It's also a primer of sorts on how a great investigative reporting happens, not with a single source or, or two dumping a perfectly constructed uh, tale in your lap, uh, but through painstaking, time-consuming, and sometimes dangerous work. Uh, but this is not a simple good guys with pens defeat bad guys with badges and guns sort of tale. There's a, a large uh, ironic twist to it because Wendy and Barbara s set their story against the backdrop of what's happening in the newspaper industry today. The circulation declines, cutbacks, bankruptcies, and owner turnovers. The Daily News itself has changed hands, what is it, like four times in the last eight years? Six, six. six times in the last eight years or so. <laughs> Meanwhile, although some of the Philadelphia cops involved in the scandal were demoted to desk jobs, none has been fired or faced charges. That's still true, right? Sure. Yeah. As Publishers Weekly said of Busted, uh, quote, it's a tough, lively lesson in how doing the right thing the right way may not be enough. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Wendy Rudiman and Barbara Laker. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Have, have some people here have read the book, right, or no? Yeah, <laughs> Roxanne's like my, my college friend, my crazy college friend. Um, I'm just gonna um, read a little bit of it. Uh, this, this part is where Barbara um, gets attacked by a crazy female drug informant. And um, in this part of the book, what we're doing is we are tracking down all of these drug informants to see what their relationship is with the cop that they're working with because we think, we have a hunch that this officer, Jeff Chuddick, had crossed the line not only with one drug informant, but with several drug informants. So our job was here tracking down drug informants. Now this woman, um, Barbara must have drawn the short straw or something because we knew she had a criminal record. We knew she had a violent criminal record. Like she had just been arrested for like smashing a beer bottle over someone's head and ripping their necklace off their chest or something. Something, and it was a guy and she was a girl and she was like like scary crazy one of these like we call her a hellcat well anyway Barbara's like well I'm just gonna go knock on her door and ask her about her relationship with this cop and I'm like okay yeah that sounds great like <laughs> check in with me and you know whatever and we really didn't think that like because we're kind of crazy I guess it didn't really dawn on us this this wasn't a good idea so this is the setup and um at the time, Brian Tierney had bought our papers and we were filing for bankruptcy and basically the papers were just, he had overpaid for the papers and we were in a lot of trouble. So, um, and I won't read too much, I promise. A few days after the Fraternal Order of Police news conference in early March 2009, Time Magazine listed the Daily News as number one on its list of the 10 most endangered newspapers in America. But Barbara and I had a plan that had nothing to do with our newspaper's predicted demise. We had to track down every drug informant who had ever worked with Jeff. 
High on our list was Tiffany, a hellcat and former stripper from the row house lined streets of Philadelphia, of Philly's Kensington neighborhood, home to a hodgepodge of hustlers, from hookers and drug dealers to minimum, minimum wage workers juggling two jobs and sorry souls eternally on the dole. Tiffany's ex-boyfriend claimed that she and Jeff had conspired to set him up in a lover's revenge plot and that Jeff lied on the search warrant used to raid his house. We wanted to hear what Tiffany had to say about Jeff. We knew she wouldn't be happy to see us, but it never, not for a minute, occurred to us that it could be dangerous for us to pursue Tef Tiffany, even though a year earlier cops had arrested her for bashing a man in the head with a glass bottle and stealing $250 and a necklace from him. On a cold gray afternoon in early March, with a snowstorm looming, Barbara knocked on the door at Tiffany's two-story red brick row house. At 28, Tiffany was the mother of two kids by two different men and still lived with her parents. Her mom, Mickey, answered the door with a marble menth menthol wedged between two fingers. Mickey stood steely and stone-faced in the doorway. Barbara offered a sunny hello and thrust out her hand, which Mickey reluctantly shook. Still gripping Mickey's palm, Barbara stepped closer and wormed her way into the living room. Mickey was a stout and sturdy woman who favored baggy t-shirts and sweats. She was 51 years old and had had the same job as a machine operator at a ribbon factory for nearly two decades, working the overnight shift from 2.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. On Friday, she stopped by the liquor store to pick up her favorite, coconut vodka. Barbara smiled as she plopped herself down on a velour couch the color of rotted red grapes and opened her notebook. I was just wondering, said Barbara, trying to sound casual. Have you ever seen Jeff? Has he ever been over to the house? Mickey proceeded to tell Barbara that Jeff had showed up on her doorstep after Tiffany got arrested for aggravated assault and robbery. He handed her 300 in cash to bail Tiffany out of jail. Wow, this is good stuff, Barbara thought, as she first felt the, the, she felt the first pinpricks of adrenaline, the rush that reporters feel when they get a juicy nugget. Barbara instinctively knew that Jeff had crossed the line when he footed Tiffany's bail. With her cheeks warm and head down, Barbara scribbled away. She flipped the blue lined pages with her fingertips like paper somersaults as quickly as Mickey spoke. She was so excited and focused that she didn't pay any attention to the loud stomps from the top of the staircase leading to the second floor. Tiffany barreled down the steps, a she-devil with a pierced nose and long, dirty blonde hair flailing, f flaring out behind her and charged towards Barbara. I'm going to, we use a curse word here, I'm going to effing kill you. When Barbara looked up, Tiffany loomed over her. The first strike came hard and fast, Tiffany's open hand slamming into Barbara's left cheek and knocking her head sideways. The second belt to Barbara's right cheek had even more for force. Barbara felt the sting of something hard, maybe Tiffany's rings, as they whacked into her cheekbone. Barbara let go of her notebook and crossed her arms over her head in an X shape to shield her face from more blows. Tiffany snatched the notebook and hurled it across the room. It landed near Mickey, who just sat there on the adjacent couch, not saying a word as Barbara cried, please no. Barbara stood up, the pen on her lap dropping to the floor and quickly grabbed her brown leather purse. She crouched low, her back hunched and darted across the room as if dodging gunfire. Her hand shook as she scooped up her notebook and sprinted out the front door. As she ran, Barbara fished around in her bottomless, sack-like purse for her cell phone. She flipped open the phone and pressed my number. Her voice was high-pitched squeak. Wendy, Wendy, she hit me. I was seated at my desk. I bolted up out of my chair and shouted, what, what happened? The reporters who sat near me looked up from their computers. The phone went dead. I dialed her back, no answer. I dialed and redialed each time getting her voicemail. I began to panic. Barbara, cheeks aflame, closed her phone when she heard fast footsteps behind her. Barbara glanced over her shoulder and saw Tiffany, a wild-eyed, fuel-raged bullet train screaming bloody murder into a cell phone. Tiffany had frantically called Jeff. At that moment, Jeff felt sick. He knew Barbara and I weren't going to stop with just Benny. We planned to track down all of his informants. In a panic, Barbara finally found her car keys. She struggled to steady her hand as she unlocked the the car door, jumped in, locked all the doors, and sped off. When she got a few blocks away, she pulled over and examined her face in the rearview mirror. She wanted to make sure she wasn't bleeding. Then she called me back. Tiffany hit me twice across the face. She threatened to kill me, Barbara said. But don't worry, I got the notebook. But... <laughs> 
I lost my pen. It wasn't funny at the time, but later the lost pen would become a running joke between us. The daily news supply closet only stocked cheap bics, which tended to leak and smudge. So Barbara brought her own special ones, paper mate profile retractable ballpoint pens in assorted colors in packs of four for $3.99 at the grocery store. To her, losing a pen was a big deal. Barbara knew the city well, having been a Philly reporter for 16 years, but this, her being her first assault, rattled her. Suddenly, she couldn't figure out how to get back to the office. She asked me to stay on the phone until she found I-95 South headed towards Center City. By the time Barbara walked into the newsroom, Brian Tierney had gathered the staff for a big announcement. Barbara joined the circle of about 40 reporters, photographers, and editors gathered around Tierney near the sports desk. Because Tierney had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection just a week ago, the staff was extra jittery and abuzz with rumors that Tierney planned to merge our ragtag ranks with the restrained Inquirer staff and close the Daily News. We'd been on journalism's endangered species list for decades, and a lot of old-timers had become numb to death threats like prisoners of war. They put out the paper each day with an attitude that said, either shoot me in the head or get out of my way. Tierney nervously swooped back his thick mane of chestnut hair across between Donald Trump's and Sean Cassidy's locks and explained that starting March 30th, the phrase, an edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer, would appear under the Daily News logo on the paper's front page. He assured us that the two papers would remain intact with separate news staffs and that the move was purely economic. Tierney hoped that making the two papers a single entity with combined circulation numbers would help boost ad sales and save us money as a single subscriber to wire, sus wire services. Instead of telling advertisers we have 300 and 330,000 circulation at the Inquirer plus the Daily News, it will help to say we have 440,000 daily circulation, Tierney explained to a room full of journalists trained to expose and rail against any cooking of the books in city government who were suddenly resigned to accepting our own creative math. But I barely heard what Tiffany was saying. I kept looking at Barbara, who stood among the crowd, somewhat dazed, touch gingerly touching her cheeks, which sported angry red slap marks. I could actually see handprints parallel to her pearl earrings. She looked dainty in those earrings with a long strand of fake pearls draped over a peach and cream colored J. Crew sweater. What kind of person would hit Barbara Laker, I thought. I could feel a nervous giggle creeping up my throat. My reaction was inappropriate and insensitive, but I couldn't help it. I kept thinking, what the F? Tiffany hauled off on Betty Crocker. It was funny. <laughs> In kind of a horrible way. You okay, I asked after the meeting. Do you think it will bruise, she said. I'm going to go get you some ice for your face. <laughs> so she did get me ice, so that was a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll start at the beginning. That Often uh, series like this start in a way that you'd never expect them to begin. So this whole series started with a drug informant, a drug addicted drug informant named Benny Martinez, who came to the paper because he had gone to the police advisory commission, which is separate than the, from the police department, with a complaint. He said that this um, police officer named Jeff Chuddock, who we're referring to in this, um, in this latest passage, he had worked with Jeff for seven years as a drug informant, which means that Benny would make buys for cocaine, heroin, whatever, in front of Jeff, and he would, if he got the drugs, he would get paid for the drugs, like 20 bucks and more for if they actually found guns when they raided the homes. But then they'd worked together a really long time, and Jeff ended up renting a home to Benny, which is against police procedure. You can't do that. And so he was renting a house. Jeff was renting a house to Benny, and Benny, with the money he made as a drug informant, was paying Jeff in rent money, which is a no-no. But where the whole case blew up is what Benny would do is he would raid, like he was really well known in the Badlands part of the city. And he busted a lot of people, including some of his close friends who he considered father figures. And um, he, I mean, hundreds upon hundreds of homes. But what he did was they ended up setting up this man who was a big time Coke dealer who hired a private attorney in Philadelphia, who was very well known, who then hired a private investigator 
because the, the, this drug dealer was convinced that something was smelly about this whole case. And he, the investigator followed Benny and found Benny going in and out of Jeff's house. And he figured out Benny was the snitch. So he wanted him dead. And because Jeff knew that um, his whole relationship with Benny could blow up and he could get in trouble with the police department, he was scared too. So Benny goes to the Police Advisory Commission for help. And he really, the guy at the Police Advisory Commission couldn't really help him. He knew Wendy because Wendy had been a source for him. And so well, the, he'd been lying. So, sorry. And so, <laughs> this is the complicated part of the story, so please stay with us. Like, yeah. well, this is the real, it will get better, I promise. So, um, so, this, so Benny comes to the Daily News and he's all emotional and he's crying and he's all upset and he's convinced that Jeff wants him dead and other police officers want him dead and drug dealers want him dead. That he's got a target on his back and that he's going to end up dead. So he comes to the paper, he starts telling Wendy this story and Wendy's like, there's something to this story. And, but it sounded really complicated. So she called me over and we started talking to Benny and that's how this whole story started where we looked into what Benny was saying. There was something about what he was saying we believed and we thought it was worth looking into. Well, and also, um, Benny had paperwork because, oops, sorry, Benny had paperwork. One reason why we could go with the story, a lot of people asked us, well, how could you take the word of a convicted drug informant over a decorated police officer? And one of the reasons was because Jeff Chuddock, the police officer, for some unknown reason, like just complete stupidity, decided to evict Benny from his house and took him to landlord tenant court. So once he did that, <laughs> Benny had this whole like paper trail where Jeff was actually trying to evict him and they had a court date and everything. And it was like, FYI, you idiot, like if you're gonna do something like, you know, that you're not supposed to be doing, like don't take the guy to landlord tenant court. Cause it, <laughs> so Barbara actually ended up going to landlord tenant court and sitting in the back and listening to the proceedings and she said it was like something out of Judge Judy like where Benny was like man I was your informant and I worked with you for seven years and he was like crying and carrying on like a lunatic and then and then Barbara went up to Jeff afterwards and said you know um, we want to talk to you about this relationship you have with Benny and he was like well I'm here as as Jeff the landlord not Jeff the cop <laughs> Like, okay. And then he gives her his, his cell, which was, like, very useful. But then, of course, he stopped answering it after a while. But, but anyway, so that was, that was one reason why we were able to go with a, a story that was essentially about them lying on search warrants and locking up drug dealers to do so. And um, Barbara and I spent hours and hours and hours in this little dusty room where the staff, the court staff wouldn't even go in there without, um, they gave us a mask and some gloves and like we were gonna get an anthrax letter or something like that and we were like, what? we don't need that but they, but we, that's how long we were in there that they were afraid we were gonna become ill but we were going through these search warrants and we wanted to go to every single house where Benny, informant number 103 and Jeff had made a bus together and we would knock on the doors of these homes, we split it up and we'd say, hey, you know, we're with the Daily News. And Barbara would go up to drug dealers and go, hi, guys. I love her. It's just like, just kind of. She would talk to me, too. Yeah, she had that, like, Columbo effect where, you know, the people would just talk to her. And, um, and so. And they were very honest. They yeah. They like, okay, I sell heroin, but I sell heroin with a skull face on the packet, not like a gun on the packet. Like yeah. They, they were very, they didn't say they weren't drug dealers. They just said they didn't sell that brand. Oh, thank you. That brand of heroin. So, and yeah. so the first few stories were about the whole thing between Jeff and Benny and the fabrication of search warrants, which in itself is like bad, but we didn't know where this series would take us at the time until we got a phone call right after the first stories ran. Well, oh, but I should say that we knew that the story was going to be unpopular um, because we happened to start writing it at a time where a lot of officers were dying on the streets of Philadelphia in the course of their job. It was a, it was a tough time in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is like, it's hard to be a police officer in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. It's very dangerous. Lots of people have guns. And I mean, I'm not saying it's the Wild West, but there was a very high um, 
at least five officers had died in a very short amount of time, and that was very unusual for the city. And so the city, rightly so, was very pro-cop and feeling very like police officers were under siege. So we put out this story, and we knew people wouldn't like it, but we, ha we had no idea, like... Again, this must be our stupidity, the backlash from the Fraternal Order of Police and the police officers um, and readers who felt like, so what if they're putting away drug dealers? Like, who cares how they do it? If, even if they're not doing it the correct way, why do we care as long as they are locking up drug dealers? And in fact, our stories got drug dealers released. Um, some some of them were like big time, like this guy Pooh Bear, who was like, and he, I know his name sounds all like warm and fuzzy, but he was this like huge badass drug dealer who lived across the street from an elementary school and the feds had to let him out. And I remember I couldn't sleep that night just thinking about the fact that we did that and I was really upset. And I called one of my cop sources who's in narcotics and I was like, I I'm really upset about this. And he said, like, you didn't do that. The cops did this. And if he's really that big a drug dealer, they'll, they'll be able to get him again. It's just a matter of time. And so, so Barbara, you want to tell about the FOP press conference? If yeah, we're sure. boring you, you can just tell yeah, us and to interrupt speed us it, with speed questions. it up. Okay. So we go to this um, Fraternal Order of Police press conference where we didn't know what we were really walking into. And it was um, John McNesby, the head of the FOP, and this is a really powerful unit union in the city of Philadelphia and there was a semicircle of all cops behind him like just with arms folded glaring at us and it was a, all the press conference was a, about was debunking our work and saying that there was nothing lower than a reporter we were even lower than a drug informant right. and then he would like point at us yeah. and we didn't know that we were the subject again stupidity we did not <laughs> know that we were the subject of the press conference we thought okay yeah they're gonna stand behind this police officer but we didn't realize that we were the subject. So there's John McNesby, the head of the union in Philadelphia. He's like the 800-pound gorilla. He's like, he's like the only thing lower than a drug informant is daily or daily news reporters. And he like points to us, and all the cops start cheering. And the next thing you know, like the video cameras all turn towards us, and they want B-roll of us. And I'm like, oh my god, like where the story, you know? So anyway, okay. Yeah, and it. then there, the police department had a website called Dome Lights, and they posted on Dome Lights that they hoped we got beaten and raped and called 911 and no one would come. They posted Wendy's home address on the website. They nicknamed us the Slime Sisters, which actually we grew to like, kind of like and joke about. Yeah, we call, that, each, other we call each other the Slime Sisters all the time. <laughs> hey, slime like, yeah. <laughs> So at first there was a bit that a real big, a lot of criticism in Philadelphia against what we were doing. But then what happened is after these stories ran, Wendy got a call from an attorney in Philadelphia who said he had a client who was a Jordanian merchant in Philly. And he said, well, you know that police squad, your narcotic squad you're writing about? Well, that squad raided my client's store. He had a corner store in Philadelphia. And he told Wendy that the that the cops came in and smashed the video surveillance cameras, cut the wires, and then looted his store and took thousands of dollars, took cigarettes, and ate all this food in the store. So the attorney asked Wendy, well, do you want to talk to him? And of course, Wendy jumped up. She was like running out the door. And she went over to the attorney's office, but the Jordanian, the client, had got scared. He didn't want to talk. And so Wendy came back kind of dejected, and we wondered what, where we should go from there. But we remembered from going through hundreds upon hundreds of search warrants that this squad had raided a number of corner store bodegas, is what they call them in Philadelphia. And compared to other, other squads may have done one, this squad did like 25, 30 within a few months. Right. And they and were raiding them under the, in Philadelphia, and I guess in Pennsylvania, and it may be the same here. It's only a crime to sell these little baggies. You know those the little crack baggies you see on the streets of bad neighborhoods. Maybe you don't, but um, they're real little. <laughs> Roxanne's kids can no. Um, so um, they're. It's only a crime, it's a misdemeanor crime, if you know or should have known that you were selling these bags for a drug use. So literally, if the cops wanted to bust these um, shop owners on a misdemeanor, they would have to ha send in a drug informant, and the drug informant would actually have to articulate, hey, like, I need some crack baggies. Um, and so <laughs> so this, is, they, this squad, this was a very elite squad, and they were spending a ton of time raiding these little stores and locking 
beating up these uh, shop owners um, on misdemeanors. And we just couldn't figure it out. And then we did. And so what we did is we pulled every single search warrant in this room where this squad had raided a corner store. And then we split them up and we decided to track down every single merchant who had been raided by this squad. And they were from all four corners of the city. They were Korean, Dominican, um, any nationality you can possibly imagine. And most of them, I mean, they were hardworking immigrants. They had no criminal record whatsoever. There was a really big language barrier because um, I met a Korean couple and I couldn't communicate with her. And we had to get relatives of theirs to tr help translate for us. But what she told us is that these cops came in. She didn't even know they were cops because they didn't have uniforms on. They had like a shirt on with police on the back. And they came in like all guns drawn, smashed the cameras. And this was a tobacco sh store that this um, Korean couple owned. And they looted the store, took thousands of dollars, like swiped the shelves and took anything they wanted, like cigarettes, like they took lottery money because the store had a lottery machine in there. And she told me that she was so scared when the cops came in, she thought she was being robbed by these people. And she said she was so scared she peed in her pants. And what happened is, so Wendy and I split these merchants up and like we would run towards each other after each interview or when we came back from the street because we were so excited because every single merchant independently told us the exact same story. And we had in the end 22 um, bodega owners or merchants corner mom and pop stores who told us this squad came in, um, smashed the cameras, cut the wires, took anything they wanted, ate deli sandwiches, drank guzzled sodas, and left the store in shambles. And these people were left to charge with the misdemeanor for having the little baggies, trying to pay attorney fees to try to get out of jail. And some of them lost their stores as a result. And this had been going on for a while in the city, and none of the merchants were saying anything. And I think they really, they came from uh, foreign countries in which the police are really bad. And, like, you know, you can, there's much more corruption than in America. And so they kind of felt like it was the street tax that they just had to pay and endure. And they didn't want, they didn't know that there was others like them. So they felt very alone. And they also feared, well, what if my store gets robbed for real, like by someone without a badge and a, but a gun. And then I call the cops and they don't come. You know what I mean? Like, so they had all these like conflicting emotions and it took us a while to convince the store owners that there was, that their collective voice had power. And so we told that story and little by little, our critics started like getting quieter and quieter and quieter. Because uh, at first, each one said they didn't want to go on the record. And what happened is we got more and more and more. We went back to all of them and said, look, you're not alone. We found all these other people who said the same thing. So every single one of them went on the record and some of them agreed to photos. And then after that story ran, we got another big break when a man named Jose Duran called. Well, he, he called me up and he said, um, I have tape, I have tape. And I did, uh, he didn't speak hardly any English, and I had five years of Spanish, and I really didn't pay attention. I had, I had Spanish in college, too, and I didn't pay any attention, and I could not speak a word of it, like a word of it. And I couldn't, I was like, oh, my God, I wish I paid attention. Like, why didn't I pay attention? So anyway, so, but I did get the gist was that he had a tape of one of these store raids, and he asked me to come over if I wanted to come over to his house and, and see this this store raid um oh no get a copy of right. it so I went after work I got a copy of it um I I was so excited like I had it in my hot little hands all night I couldn't sleep thinking like what's on this thing what's on this thing we get into the oh I call one of my narcotics friends so I have a I had a really good source in narcotics he, we couldn't have done the story without a lot of police officers and a lot of their help and this guy was he, I mean, he was just so ballsy. Like, he could, not only could he have lost his job, but he could have been killed for the things that he did for us because he was part of one of these elite squads, but on another squad. And he was afraid that if it got out that he was helping us, then they wouldn't, if he called for backup on the street, they wouldn't come. 
He could be fired. But he was coming over to the Daily News building to help us identify the officers on the tape and also interpret for us what was protocol, what wasn't protocol. And he actually, like, just strode in, like, just came into the Daily News offices, and then we put the tape in. And because the Daily News is so, like, janky ass, we could not get the tape to work. And we tried and tried and tried to get this tape to work, and we tried all different computers. We tried to get graphics involved, and we were just so frustrated. And I said, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to drive back over to Jose's house. And Jose lived in New Jersey across the bridge, right? So I, I apologized to my cop source, and he's like, well, I'll come with you. I'll come with you. So, like, he got in the back. We had these company cars, which... PT Cruisers. Yeah, and I couldn't <laughs> drive without a pillow or a couple of pillows. Did I drive you, Joe? No. We don't let Wendy drive. It's <laughs> all possible. It's a dangerous thing. I'm a really, really bad driver. That's right. I sat in, well, he hid in the back seat. Yeah. He laid down in the back seat, and we drove out of Philadelphia. We went to Jose's house. Jose put the tape in for us. We introduced the cop as just, hey, this is just our friend. And Jose kind of was this not his head, you know. We put the tape in, and there it showed, like, the cops, like, cutting the camera wires with bread knives, then looking at the register, then, like, looking back up at the camera, then saying, like, you know, th there's there's this many eyes or that many eyes, and you can't watch that video. You cannot watch that video and not know that they're up to no good. So the police officer turns to Jose, and they don't even, I mean, Jose hardly speaks any English, and he says, uh, the cop says, oh, my God, these cops are in so much effing trouble. And Jose goes, I know, right? I know. <laughs> and so, like, after we watched it that night, we, me and Barbara and the cop, we went to um, Applebee's. Applebee's. We went to Applebee's <laughs> near the Cherry Hill Mall. And, um, <laughs> and it was, like, the worst food, the worst service, but it was, like, the most wonderful <laughs> night of, of just having this evidence in our hands. And then, and then it took us a long – the hardest part of that was transcribing the tape because it had audio, and we had to make sure that we put the right words in the right cop's mouth because we were afraid about getting sued. Well, also, we knew if we made one mistake that – the, all the critics could jump on us and say, like, everything they've written isn't true. Yeah. And so we had to make sure that there wasn't one mistake. Yeah. And so we, we had the, the whole transcript in the paper. We had photos of the, of the store raid. Now, what we did do is we did blur out their faces. Their, their faces are in the book. But, yeah, for the yeah, newspaper, right, right. <laughs> but for the newspaper series, our editor decided to take the high road because in the beginning... Jeff's attorney said, look, these people are, these cops are risking their lives and they're undercover. And if you put their photos out there, then they can get killed. And so we decided, okay, we'll blur out their faces. But the, when we ran on philly.com, the video, I mean, the computer was crashing all the time because everyone wanted to see this video of what the cops were up to. Yeah, because it was very clear, not only visually, but you could hear what they were saying. And, and it's caught on camera, and you can see the officer with the bread knife um, slicing the camera wire. In, um, and it was really like, it's one of those moments as a reporter, like, wow, wow. Like, yeah, you said, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, then so the next part of this series we went to is we'd heard early on that one of the cops in this squad was known as the boob man. And he was known as the boob man even f in suburban police departments. Because one cop, Ben Salem cop, actually called me and he said, you know that squad you're writing about? Well, you should look at Tom Tolstoy. He's the boob man. And he likes these large-breasted women. And he takes them into rooms and sexually assaults them during raids. And we'd heard rumblings of this on the street, too, that this, there was a cop in this squad who did that, this. So what we had to do, this was probably the most challenging part of the series. We went back to the search warrant room. We didn't have names of these women. We didn't have addresses of these women. So we pulled hundreds upon hundreds of search warrants where this, because every cop on a search warrant has a badge number, and we knew his badge number. So we pulled every warrant where we knew that cop had been in a raid. We didn't know if a woman was in the house. We didn't know what had happened in the house. All we knew is that this cop had been on that raid within a two-year time span. We did it for two, two years. There were hundreds and upon hundreds of addresses, and we went door to door to door to door, splitting them up and trying to find people who had been in the homes during these raids to see what had happened. And three, four weeks had passed, and we, we'd knocked on so many doors, we were going like bat crazy. And there was one Friday night where we were just 
at the point of thinking, well, maybe we just will never find these women. They will never find them. And I was on this street called Thayer Street in Philadelphia. And a lot of these homes, after they're raided, they're boarded. So you can't even find the people anymore. And so this one block had like four houses that had been raided, all boarded. And I called Wendy and I said, you know, we're never going to find this woman. I'm like really depressed about this. We need to find them. And so I thought, okay, I'll just knock on a few more doors next to these boarded houses. So I knocked on a home next to a boarded house. This man named Angel answered. And he said, well, you know, when that house was raided, this woman came downstairs. She was crying her eyes out and said something horrible had happened during the raid. And I said, Angel, I really need to find that woman. Can you help me find her? And I sat on his rickety porch while he dialed his cell phone like for an hour and a half to try to find me. Her name is Dagma, Dagma's address. So after he, he was so sweet, he was on the phone for hours, and then he gave me the address. So I'm driving over, I'm calling Wendy on the phone saying, I think this could be it, I think this could be it. And so I drove over to her house, Dagma wasn't home, and her cousin told me she'd be home maybe in an hour and a half. She was out with her fiance. So I waited and waited, and finally Dagma came home, and her cousin went up to the car and said, hey Dagma, a Daily News reporter's here, she wants to ask you what happened during the raid. And this is a moment I'll never forget. Dagma got out of the car, she walked towards me, tears rolling down her face, she hugged me and she said, I've been praying for this day. And it was one of those moments where you think, this is why I went into journalism, because Dagma, right after this had happened, she told her fiance, she told her friends, her neighbors, she went to the district police to complain about this cop, because he had groped her and fondled her breast, she thought she was gonna get raped, and nobody did anything. And so we, had, we ended up finding three women, and I'll let you can talk about the last woman we found because that was the most um, disturbing. But we ended up finding three women who had been sexually assaulted by this cop. Um, the last woman, we changed her name actually. She was one of the few people we, everybody was mostly on the record. We, we tried to avoid off the record sources at, um, as much as possible. For her, we changed her name because we felt like she was almost a rape victim and we wanted to protect her. But this officer had shoved his fist up her vagina and she was bleeding. So she went to the hospital right afterwards that very night and filed a complaint. Um, and internal affairs like knew that knew the cop who did it. She didn't know who it was, but internal affairs knew because they had gotten similar complaints. And so that very night they pulled him off the street. But then the police began to harass her. Her story is that they would come up and they would say, you better not, you better withdraw that complaint. You better not do this. You better not do that. And so she, she kind of disappeared. And I think at one point she moved to New Jersey. So without her, the, the internal affairs put this cop back on the street. And I think two years passed before we found her. And yeah, it took uh, a long time to find her because she'd moved. All these people we found had moved since the raid. So it wasn't like we didn't have a name or address. And even if we did, the, the women had moved. But um, the woman, Naomi, was so scared because what would happen is a cop car would roll up when she still lived in the house where this had happened. And they pulled her into the car and said, you better drop that case or otherwise, you know, you'll be sorry. And then they would keep harassing her on her cell phone. She had to change her cell phone number numerous times. She moved so many times that she was so petrified that she wasn't going to ever, she'll never testify. Naomi will never testify. But uh, they did a rape kit on her that night. And like Wendy said, they pulled the cop off the street because they knew who he was. They had a file on him and he was known not only as the boob man, but whenever these cops did a raid where um, Tolstoy had taken a woman somewhere else, um, all three women told us another cop who was in the squad would come upstairs and say, are you okay up there? Because the, the cops knew what he was up to and they wanted to interrupt it, but they would never, they would never cooperate with internal affairs, but they wanted it to end. And then, um, well, now Tolstoy, he's on desk duty. He's been on desk duty since, like, what? 2009. Since 2009. And he wants to open a charter school for, for high school students who are interested in law enforcement. And we, you know, the Daily News didn't want to put his picture in the paper. Um, you know, we, we, you know we, we were pretty gutsy, but we, 
legally, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We had one attorney for the entire paper, and he, for all three news outlets, Philly.com, The Inquirer, The Daily News, and we he was overwhelmed with the bankruptcy and he wasn't even a libel attorney so he didn't even really know what he was doing so i mean he he knew yeah. about bankruptcy he knew the ins and outs of bankruptcy but anyway harper collins <laughs> harper collins was like hell let's just their attorney like went over it with us and we finally got to put his picture in the book and we were really really excited, we were really excited. like we were like oh my <laughs> god harper collins is letting us put his picture in the paper and like we haven't been into philly lately because we've been like touring around but we're just sort of of like wondering like oh god like what's gonna happen when we yeah. get back like because he's the one on the jose duran video who's seen looking at the camera then looking at the cash register and looking at the camera because he was waiting for the camera to go dark yeah so and, um, i guess that's it that's good but we don't want you to think the book is not like a recap of the newspaper series it's really the story behind the story and it and barbara and i are characters in the book and we put a lot of our like baggage in the book um real characters like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um because we felt like you know we wanted we want to tell our the story and we want people to feel like they know us and i don't think we come across as complete angels in the book either and um you know it's warts and all kind of book and jeff chuddick um the cop who the investigated investigation started with, like we actually, he doesn't come off that all that bad, you know, because people are people are complicated and flawed, and and not everybody's black and white, and so, I mean, there's a scene of him in the video in Jose Duran's video where there's a 12 year old child in the store, and Jeff goes up to him with tenderness and asks him how old he is, where he lives, what's his name, and he kind of puts his hand around him and says, okay, you go. And so we think, after we looked at you know all the cops involved, we think that Jeff is kind of a gray character. There's good, there's bad, and we actually think that he rented a house to Benny to help him out. Right, because Benny really, he was really like a, the biggest con artist ever. And in a lot of ways, he, he cons me. Um, he, he just like played on my psyche to the point where like I could relate to what Jeff was going through. Not like I wanted him dead, but um, he did end up getting protection from the FBI. And he was in witness protection, but he kept going back into the city to buy drugs and then apologize to drug dealers for setting them up. Like, you know, he was just... Uh, he had a very bad drug habit and that drove him to go back <laughs> to put it mildly that drove him to return to the city um and put himself in danger and just really vex the fbi but i remember one time he called me and this was lo we no longer were relying on him we had moved on to the the, the mom and pop stores and then to the women but he would call me all the time and he was kind of like one of these we call it like source maintenance he's like a someone you you don't need them anymore, but you feel you don't want to just brush them off and they become like your cross to bear. So Benny would like call me up and talk to me for hours and hours. And so the FBI had moved him to a spot that was kind of rural and he, he liked to smoke. Now he had been in jail. He had been stabbed. He had been like his wife, multiple wives would drag him out of crack houses and all this other stuff. And he was scared of the fox in the foxes. I never it's it's foxes, right? Or fox in his backyard in the backyard where they had him and he would call me up and be like you know i'm trying to have a cigarette and these these foxes he's staring at me he's gonna rip my throat out and it would be like one o'clock in the morning you know and i'd be like jesus benny like man up like man you know i'd just be sitting there on the phone with him you know and um we we haven't um we haven't heard from him but but I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like when we get back to Philly because we call John McNesby, who's the head of the FOP, and he's a very powerful guy. Like we we describe him as like a thick, fat neck turkey, turkey neck. neck. So I mean, we just go to town on him, <laughs> and like I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Again. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, we're gonna shut up now. Okay. <laughs> Hi, very nice presentation. I um, 
I'm wondering, did the FBI then interview you and then the whole thing stalled out for prosecution? Or did they communicate with you as to, they interviewed you, obviously, I would assume. No, they never, inter they never talked to us. And the sad part is, is that these women were never interviewed, never. And initially, after we broke the Bodega story, the FBI did interview some of them, but they were never called before a grand jury and they were never re-interviewed. And so I think the most discouraging thing for us is if, say for the women example, if these were white suburban wealthy women, they would have been interviewed and probably the person who did this would have been at least charged with sexual assault or whatever charge they would have filed against him. Yeah, it's, fr it's frustrating because we don't know what's going on with the FBI. I mean, in my heart, I suspect nothing you know that nothing's nothing's going on with the investigation and John McNesby the head of the FOP he's he's been steadfast that that these cops are, are didn't do anything wrong and they'll be back on the street and that they will also get back the, not only are they gonna um, win money back they're gonna win hypothetical overtime basically millions of dollars in money that they would have earned had they been working the streets so um, he's confident that 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 we they're going to have a celebration and you know we'll come out and but then your legislatures in Pennsylvania because I'm thinking of Baltimore and our little scandal in Baltimore <laughs> yeah, right. and the uh, you know the legislature picked that one up and and started going towards the governor have your legislatures in Pennsylvania picked it up no, not really. No, I mean, I think when the stories first came out, there was a lot of energy around it. The FBI had a press conference. The police department was saying, we're going to investigate this. Mayor Nutter was there. There was a lot of energy around it. And then it just, it just kind of fizzled or got quiet. And in the meantime, in Philadelphia, like every other day, a police officer in narcotics is getting locked up. Not these officers, because they're on the riding the desk but it seems like every other day there's a cop locked up for stealing from drug dealers so you know it's like i don't know a city that a historic city that doesn't learn from its history ever you know thank you yeah um what i'm wondering is uh who protects you i mean you got all these people protecting each other we protect uh, each oh, other yeah, Barbara, yeah. Barbara <laughs> but i mean you have like, do you have a background in the theater or something? I mean, what <laughs> what drives you to do this kind of stuff and think you're going to get away with it? I mean, these guys <laughs> that you're, you know, that you're you're going after, they they think they're going to get away with it. But how do you figure you're going to get away with what you're doing? I mean, you know what, what does do this I for am. reporters? Well, you know, it's a funny thing because we didn't really think about that when we wrote the book. And we were in New York City and we were going to uh, an event in New York City. And um, our driver, the guy who was driving us, said, I said, so what are you here for? And we were like, oh, we have we wrote a book. And he said, what's it about? We said, it's about police corruption, about these corrupt cops in Philly. And he was like, oh, they must really love you in, in Philly, those cops. Like, if I were you, I'd be sleeping with a bulletproof vest. Like, you're going to get <laughs> killed. And Barbara and I were like, like, again really you think <laughs> like oh no <laughs> you know? um but uh to be honest i think that i think that reporters that report in foreign countries and in war-torn countries and in countries with um with little with no democracies um they're in much more danger than anything barbara and i, I have done i mean i really think like that that's 10 times more dangerous than what we do. I mean, and there were two instances where we were scared. One was, we, other than me being hit, but when we had to walk like from the office to the garage, you have to walk across the street, and we were working really late hours. And so there were nights where we'd leave the building and walk to the garage, and there, would, there was an SUV just parked at a stop sign, not a stoplight, but a stop sign. And it had an FOP sticker on the back. They were off-duty cops, and they were just sitting there watching us. And we were scared that they would follow one of us home, and they could do anything. And um, one was the other. Oh, the other time, we were, we were not scared of, like, the drug dealers, but we were scared of getting caught in the crossfire. So one time we were driving, and this time we were together because we, we spent a short amount of time reporting together right after I got hit. And we were driving through what they call the Badlands. And these two guys started arguing across the street right in front of our car. 
and one of them said he was going to go get his piece. And then we thought, oh, we got to get out of here because, you know, that's the danger that you could get caught. Not that we were the target, but that we could get just caught in the crossfire. So having once worked where you work and knowing what you've lost in terms of people and editors and everything else, first of all, I'm just totally in awe of what you guys have done. Like, oh, it's, oh, thank well, you. It is. I mean, it's oh, awesome. Thanks. I mean, thank you. It's, it's, it's incredible. So I have a question a little bit outside the book. Philadelphia is a really violent city, like on a low level. And I say that, you know, as somebody who loves the city. But, you know, people are getting beat on in public places and caught on video. And I think there, there are like five times the amount of murders this year, number of murders, as there are in New York. Mm -hmm. Not per capita, just... So my question is, do you, do you think that, that that has something to do with bad policing and the fact these guys are running their own games and, and not doing what they're supposed to do? Because I've wondered. I mean, I don't think yeah. the people are that different than other cities. I, I think that, that, that the police are very short-sighted, the, especially the hierarchy. Like, they don't – I mean, if – if people don't trust the police officers, then there's lawlessness, right? And so um, they don't realize that for one bad apple, it, it erodes the trust of the very people they need to help solve crimes. And um, it's, I also think that there's a culture for some reason w among the narcotics cops about with taking money that it's kind of we were sort of shocked by that that it's kind of just everybody does it and these are drug dealers and we don't we work for fifty thousand dollars a year we may make a hundred thousand dollars with the overtime but look at these drug dealers and we're not, and, and it's also this feeling that they're losing against the drug war that it's just this fruitless effort so why not take some money and mm -hmm. who's gonna know and it's not a big deal and it's like my extra pay and it's really like the mentality is pretty deep within the, the police department and I do think that that does contribute to a feeling like screw it if the cops are gonna I just got we just got a letter from a drug dealer and I believe him he said I'm tired of paying off this specific cop I have had it I can I, we all the drug dealers agree like and they can tell you the corners the drug dealers like they send me letters and they say we're sick of this guy we're sick of paying him off and it's like you know Frankly, I don't, I, I'm sick of the story. Like, I'm ready to, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many times you can write the same thing and have nothing happen. Well, because the FBI was, uh, they were following two, they wanted to find two drug dealers in North Philly who were stealing from drug dealers and people on the street. And so they were watching these two drug dealers, I mean, two cops, and then while they're filming videotaping in the neighborhood, what do you know, two other cops, they right on camera, they steal from drug dealers and neighbors in the neighborhood and they weren't even the guys they were looking for so that's how systemic it is in the in the police department um thank you for i i i believe this is a quite important book to be honest with you um oh, thank you i um i lived in l.a for a long time and the, the, you know, i mean stories like that were rampant in l.a too about uh, mm -hmm. especially about in a drug department and especially um of, of basically often uh, um, cops abusing minorities uh, in, in a rampant way, planting evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But I was wondering, um, l l because you, you, you said this, this has gone nowhere. Did, um, was this ever discussed in the city council? I mean, nothing went on in the city council? Nothing went on with a local prosecutor? Uh, n nothing went on there? I mean, local um, uh, universities, students, uh, law departments didn't decide, well, maybe we got to go and do something for, for these people, A, B. Um, how do you see, because you didn't talk about that, I'm sure you put it in your book. Obviously, over the last 20, 30 years in the United States of America, I'm not from the United States of America, I'm from the Caribbean, I grew up in the Netherlands, uh, where a lot of this, uh, although lately, because of my growing minorities in the Netherlands, this is happening. But when I, I remember when I, I went directly from the Netherlands to L.A., when they kn knew that I was an attorney, people would pull me into Watts, right? And going to USC, oh, Greg, the please don't go to Watts, you're going to get killed. I'm going to Watts, I'm from the Caribbean, who's going to kill me in Watts, you know? And the stories I heard here from people, unbelievable, the, the abusive stories, I mean, of cops towards, uh, towards the citizens, you know, that basically in the Netherlands, at that point in time, basically the entire police department plus the, plus the head of the police department would have been locked up for the rest of their lives. 
But I think the big problem that you have here with, with this kind of one drugs, one crime, you know, zero tolerance policing, uh, blacks are the dangerous people. Well, yeah, you know, so, you know, guys got to do what they have to do. Uh, you know, yeah, it might not all be good, but yeah. So the question is, if all of these policing tactics, you know, zero tolerance policing, one drug, did you see them, uh, you know, feeding into all of the uh, of, of basically this these guys getting away from that and this justification for this kind of much much more kind of. Uh, illegal and brutal policing uh, that that is clearly that you, you you talk about and that is really rampant in many different places thank you um i i think like in new york city for instance what's happening with stop and frisk you know um how how new yorkers feel very safe like who live in manhattan it's a very it feels very safe the whole city feels really really safe but in certain areas a lot of minorities feel under siege and they feel there's a separate rule for them and a separate rule for the people who live in you know uh, the upper west side or the upper east side and i think that that's in all cities all all cities all across america every single big city with a drug problem and gun problem i think that minorities feel like they're being singled out and that they can't walk the streets with the same kind of freedom that I can walk the streets. And it's, it's, it's damaging. And I think uh, you saw that in New York where, pe where people, you know, they, the, the Civil Liberties Union stepped in, they filed a lawsuit, it went to court, it went to federal court, and now, you know, but, but there was a lot of debate. Like my, my brother, who's like very liberal, lives on the Upper West Side, like loved Bloomberg and loved Stop and Frisk and, you know, just because it, it kept the city, it kept them safe. They felt it kept like, you know what I mean? Like even liberal people sort of like bought into the idea that this was a good thing for, and that kind of surprised me, but he was like a big like Bloomberg, Ray Kelly fan when they were in the midst of racial profiling, I mean, um, stop and frisk, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was like a Freudian thing to stop and frisk. Yeah, um, hi, um, first of all, this is shocking to me, um, but uh, maybe not. Um, I, I, I worked at HUP for 10 years and, um, and um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I know I go to Philadelphia about twice a month, and I know about the police uh, shootings and and things like that. Uh, I can't believe that that these police got away with what they've gotten away with, sort of. But um, I just want to make one quick s statement or comment and say that when we were at uh, when I was at HUP, we loved the daily news. And, uh, Thank you. Main, <laughs> mainly because of the sports page. Right, but, yeah, right, right, right. But, I know. Um, I just, I can always remember, I think it was 1995, um, and on the front page of the Daily News was a picture of Mickey Mantle, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it said going because he was about to die from liver cancer. And, uh, and on the back page, uh, Jerry Garcia had just died, and it said gone. Yeah, yeah. And, That's and the daily we, news for you. <laughs> yeah, that is the daily news. Yeah, and we had that in our lab. We cut it and put it up there and, um, and always loved the daily news for that. Uh, not, not because of the tragedy of Mickey Mantle and Jerry Garcia, but just because yeah. you guys did that. But um, I just wanted to say one other thing that I – you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm a pretty big guy, and I was, I was robbed in like a 15th and Chestnut, and when I was at Jefferson, um, it was a, a smash and grab, they told me, the, uh, the police, that, um, you know, I, I was just walking, and I didn't even see this guy come, and he just tackled me, mm. uh, they smashed the head of my uh, humorous on the curb um, unfortunately it wasn't my head and then another guy would come and grab your wallet and that's what they did and I I talked to the I was talking to the police officer and he and he <laughs> said to me um, he goes I, I explained what happened and he, he goes oh yeah that's a new thing in Philly now 
everybody's getting that. So, and he was pretty nonchalant about it. But uh, yeah, we uh, some of our staffers, the Signe, yeah. our cartoonist was recently same thing, like yeah. just recently. And did but, they break uh, her teeth? No, no, they hit her in the like in the jaw. Yeah, yeah. but but we don't want to get. I mean, I walk around the city, and I mean, I don't live in fear i don't we don't want to give the impression that it's like you know they're they're that it's that bad i mean <laughs> you know um yeah yeah i i understand and i really didn't have a question i just wanted to tell you about you know uh, daily news was real popular at home uh, at least in our lab all right <laughs> thank you very much thank thanks. you thanks thanks <laughs> Sure. Sure. Yeah. Wanna, uh, we're doing. You want to go, go ahead. ahead? We're doing <laughs> a um, story on. We're working on a series of stories that we're calling "Perfect Prey," and it focuses on the Social Security Administration, which I know is like easy pickings, right? It's like low-hanging fruit. That place is such a mess. But um, we're working on. We didn't know this, but in Philadelphia, there's an underground economy in addition to the drugs, and that underground economy is people, uh, people as commodities. And so people in these some of these neighborhoods will collect, literally collect people who are elderly or disabled or have mental disabilities and get them to sign over their SSI checks, their Social Security disability checks, and then give them the very, very bare minimum of food, shelter, what have you, and you can make a whole business out of this. Like you, you can collect people and make money, and it's just, it's just unbelievable to us. And some, in the severe cases, people are like tied up and beaten and hidden from view. And then in the borderline cases, like, you know. Um, a detective who ha was very helpful to us on some of the series, you know, she said, I, and I went to this house and she had like 10 or 12 people in there and they were sleeping in the basement and they were on soiled mattresses and she was feeding them hot dogs every night, hot dogs, hot dogs. And I just, all I could think about was like how my kids will only eat hot dogs and how they eat hot dogs every <laughs> night. And I was just like, oh my God, like, I was like, that's terrible, terrible, you know, but her point was that, that, that hot dogs are cheap and that, the woman had a lock on the refrigerators and and so it's sad. it's really sad it's a real it's gotten to me it's gotten to me this these stories that Barbara and I are doing now have, have gotten to me so much more than any stories that I've ever written where like I am crying at work and I'm not a crier lately I'm a crier yeah. though right <laughs> like I cry writing these stories they're just so sad well they prey on people who are so handicapped they can't talk they can't say anything there was one that was um he was deaf and couldn't speak and other people who are so you know they're mentally slow so they can't eat the sad part is is even if th when these people are charged with a crime the victims can't testify in court and so the people who are doing this are getting off either totally off or they get probation and yeah. they know it, that they know that their victims can't, aren't good witnesses. And I mean, Social Security, they're just like, like asleep at the wheel. They don't really care. These people come in with a person who's clearly incapacitated and they're like, oh, we're going to be their rep payee. We're going to handle their benefits. And meanwhile, the person has like 10 bankruptcy filings and like has been evicted from their homes like numerous times. It's like red flag, red flag. And they're just like stamp, move on, next person. So. Have you talked to any movie or... Oh. Real quick question, have you talked to any um, movie or uh, TV producers? Yeah, we did in the, uh, we have, and we have an agent who's working on that for us. Yeah, and know, he just so sent us a note saying that, that Sarah Jessica Parker is interested, in is busted. interested, everybody's <laughs> interested, and we're like, well, she's not good enough for us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>